when we get started, thank you very much everyone that's joining us today on Beyond Borders, your path to permanent residency in Canada. Um, so glad you could be with us today. We are joined by uh, by Geraldine from GHV um, Consultant, a certified um, uh, immigration consultant uh, located in Alberta, but, but licensed across country. Um, she's uh, the third time she's been with us today to, to do a session such as this, um, and we're happy you can join us. Um, and so a little bit of housekeeping, if you can, first. Um, we will, of course, uh, um, allow questions. Um, if you can hold your questions to the end, that would be great. And we'll read off the ones we can and make sure they all get answered. Um, those we do not get to, we'll ensure we do get you answers after the session is over, um, if we need to. If there are questions that come up that are very um, pertinent to the actual slide that we're on, so such as if we are talking about um, immigration in Alberta and you had a question considering just about Alberta, we will address a question at that time, if that's appropriate. Um, so without further ado, since no one really tuned in to speak to me, uh, I will introduce uh, Geraldine from uh, GHV. Uh, hi, John. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And thanks for everyone. I can see we do have like 29 attendees or probably like 25 attendees for this uh, webinar. Uh, yeah, like what John said, this is my third webinar sponsored by ADECO. So I will be uh, with you for the next one hour and I will do my best to walk you through uh, your options of applying for a permanent residency. So uh, yeah, I am Geraldine and I am a regulated Canadian immigration consultant or RCIC uh, or in layman term, licensed uh, immigration consultant. And I do have my office in the province of Alberta and British Columbia. And I am representing my office, GHV Immigration Services. Uh, if you ask, my professional practice uh, revolves around the Canadian immigration law Temporary Foreign Workers, or TFW, LMIAs, Economic Immigration, Study Permits, and Family Reunification, or uh, the Family Sponsorships. So uh, prior to starting my immigration practice, I was actually working uh, in the immigration or recruitment industry in a corporate and agency uh, environment. So I was uh, responsible for uh, recruiting top talents for large organizations in Canada and abroad. And uh, I do believe I have some attendees here from my LinkedIn uh, network. And thank you for uh, joining in. I could say that uh, my passion in uh, immigration is a reflection of my years of experience spent in many countries around uh, the world. I actually worked around the Middle East. Uh, I came from, I worked in Qatar, Bahrain, uh, United Arab Emirates or, or Dubai, and I also worked in Japan. I experienced dealing with my cultures and help uh, people understand uh, ways of immigrating to Canada. Um, I could say that I was also once a newcomer like you. I was a landed immigrant and I have started my way through the federal skilled worker stream. And I am now a Canadian citizen living here in Alberta with my uh, family. So aside from being an RCIC, uh, which is a license that is federally uh, recognized, I am also a temporary foreign worker recruiter licensee for the province of BC and Saskatchewan. And I'm also a member of the Canadian Association of Professional uh, Immigration Consultants and has a registered a professional recruiter designation. Uh, bulk of my clients are international students, uh, TFWs are temporary foreign workers and permanent resident aspirants. I have, uh, I could say that I have shared uh, pains and challenges of people within these spaces. I have heard different stories, uh, tried to help them navigate the application process, understand the system and educate them on what Canada is really looking for an ideal candidate to settle in this uh, beautiful country. And I hope that this webinar really helps each and every one of you for the next one hour. Yeah, back to you, John.
sorry, so I'm mute. <laughs> I learned that in the last three years, you know, get off mute. Yeah, it um, <laughs> <laughs> so with their introductions, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about current events, um, some things that are very pertinent to the individuals we deal with every day. Um, how to work in Canada after you graduate and what to do while you are visiting in Canada. And, and those laws, have, as you would have known, have changed f fairly uh, uh, frequently over the last couple of years. So we'll talk about the most recent upticks um, in those um, subjects. Um, options of permanent residency in the applications and looking at the, the migration to the provinces. We've all heard about and seen articles of people obtaining um, their PRs quicker and, and uh, um, in different ways in different provinces. So we're going to talk about some of those differences. Um, when did you call an immigration consultant or immigration lawyer? So I know some many people have tried to navigate the process on their own or have uh, friends or relatives who've tried to navigate the process on their own. And we're going to talk about what the different circumstances in which you would want to um, bring in the services of someone like a Geraldine or an immigration lawyer themselves. And then we'll look at what's next. Um, and then um, hopefully during that time, you can answer some more of your questions. Um, and again, like I mentioned, what the questions we don't get to today, um, we'll aspire to get to answers as soon as we possibly can after the session is over. Uh, so that I'll turn it back to you, Geraldine. Thanks, John. Um, okay, uh, we'll be talking about the Canada's public policy and immigration updates released in uh, 2023 or this year. As you know, Canada is known for like a changing policies almost overnight. No, uh, but then these policies that have been released is definitely uh, to the advantage of number one, work permit holders. So uh, as of now, work permit holders get more flexibility to also study in Canada. So it was issued, the policy was issued in June 7 of this year, and it will end on June 27, 2026. So if you were a valid work permit holder or a TFW on June 7 onwards, and if you are eligible, you can study without a study permit. You don't need to apply for a study permit until the earliest of either you check the expiry date of your work permit or until the public policy expires, which is which is June 27, 2026. Definitely it is it is a very good uh policy. Public policy means temporary policy that was issued by IRCC. So under uh, number two under the express entry. Six new attribute-based express entry categories have been introduced. So uh, these new categories open up opportunities for candidates in specific fields, and that includes uh, the healthcare, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or STEM, no STEM professions. Uh, they also have for trades such as carpentry, uh, plumbing, transportation, agriculture, uh, agri-food, as well as individuals with strong French language abilities. Now, it's a targeted, um, I mean, a draw under the express entry. So number three, uh, for the PGWP holders, this is also a very good uh, public policy issued by the IRCC. So some current and former PGWP holders may be eligible for an 18-month open work permit extension or PGWP extension. So under this uh, public policy, PGWP holders uh, whose permit uh, expired or will expire between September 20, 2021 and uh, until December uh, 31 of this year, you will be able to maintain or restore your legal status and obtain an open work permit while in Canada. I got lots of uh, clients, uh, you know, um, under this uh, policy. And many um, international students or our current PGWP holders uh, do not know that there is a current policy like this. So uh, yeah, watch out. So number four, uh, family members of temporary foreign workers. So when we say temporary uh, family members, so we are talking about your spouse or common law partner and dependent children, uh, dependent children that is below 20, 22 years old. So this new policy has been released that allows uh, dependent children 
of temporary foreign workers to be eligible for open work permit as well. So in the recent years, it was only the spouse or common law partner that can be granted an open work permit. So this measure aims to you know, uh, combat labor uh, shortages in Canada and provide more opportunities for a family to stay together and somehow fit into Canadian uh, communities. So uh, the, the fifth one is the parents' uh, grandparents program. So IRCC will accept up to 15,000 complete applications for sponsorship under this program this year. Uh, beginning October 10th, IRCC will be, uh, you know, will begin sending invitations to apply or ITA to 24,200 interested potential sponsors. They aim to receive up to 15,000 complete applications. So make sure that when, when you send your application, you receive an invitation to apply, make sure that your application is complete. So invitations will be sent over the course of two weeks, for two weeks. Anyone who submitted an interest to sponsor form in the year 2020, so three years ago, if you did not receive an invitation to apply in 2021 or, or in 2022, you are encouraged to check the email account you provided uh, in uh, 2020 when you submitted your interest to sponsor form you may receive an email or an invitation to apply. So number six, this is very popular actually uh, right now. To those on a visitor status. Now, uh, again, it's a public policy that has been uh, out by the IRCC that those um, foreign nationals who are in Canada on a visitor status and who receive a valid job offer will continue to uh, be able to apply for and receive a work permit without having to leave the country. You don't need to go to the border, for example, you know, to, to get your work permit you know, uh, yeah, after the application. So this temporary policy has been extended for another two years or until February 28th of 2025. Uh, to be eligible to apply, an applicant looking to benefit from this temporary policy uh, must have a valid status in Canada as a visitor on the day you apply. Of course, you have a valid job offer that is supported by an LMIA or LMIA exempt offer of employment. Submit an application for an employer specific work permit no later than uh, the deadline, which is February 28, 2025 and you need to meet all other standard admissibility uh, criteria. Let's go to, and of course there are many more uh, public policy and immigration updates that were given by uh, the IRCC. And uh, yeah, but for now I'll be indulging with this uh, public policy. Let's talk about the Canada's uh, planned permanent residency admission. So if you can see on the slide, Canada's planned peer admission for the economic category, Canada-wide. So we are talking about uh, the federal skilled workers class of the express entry, the Canadian experience class, federal uh, skilled trades of the express entry, startup business class, investors, entrepreneurs, and self-employed persons class. So in the year 2023, Canada targets a PR admission of 465,000. And uh, for the year 2024, it is 485,000. And for the province of Quebec alone, their target is to admit 52,500 residents. So again, uh, Canada is a land of immigrants. Why Canada accepts so many immigrants? So based on the, uh, the 2021 census, there are more than 450 ethnics or cultural origins or nationalities in Canada. Uh, immigrants contribute to the economy and create jobs for uh, Canadians. So uh, again, based on the statistics, one in three business owners is an immigrant. Another justific justification for high immigration targets was uh, simple, 
Canada has an aging population and a low birth rate. So this demographic uh, realities will uh, create economic challenges for sure in, in the years to come. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, like what I've said, how can you transition from being a student to worker up to being a permanent resident? The same applies to those with a visitor status. Oh, uh, next. Let's talk about uh, the students for now. How can you transition from being a student to being a worker, uh, a work permit holder, and to being a permanent resident? So after graduation, many of you uh, must be knowing about this. You may be eligible to work temporarily or even live uh, permanently in Canada. And uh, you need, uh, I mean, uh, a type of work permit to, to work, and that is a post-graduation work permit. So this a PGWP, it allows you to uh, I mean, to work for any employer across Canada that will, of course, allow you to gain a Canadian work experience, which is highly relevant in applying for jobs in Canada and can help you in your permanent residency application. So let's move to the uh, some facts on uh, PGWP. Number one, it cannot be extended or nor renewed, it is a one-time deal, so make sure to uh, use it wisely. However, IRCC again announced a public policy that allowing uh, PGWP holders to apply for a permit extension of up to 18 months. Now, uh, it is actually, uh, I mean, this policy has been released uh, twice in a row. And um, the latest one is if your PGWP is expired between September 20, 2021 and December 31 of this year, you will be able to maintain or restore your legal status and obtain an open work permit while in Canada. You can apply for a PGWP extension for up to 18 months. So it's not automatic that you will receive an extension of 18 months. It is up to 18 months. That is the maximum. So how long uh, the PGWP is valid? In a normal, normal world, you will only be granted eight months to three months of PGWP. So number three, graduation from a DLI or public schools does not automatically make you eligible for PGWP you have to put an application forward to qualify. So apply for it as soon as you receive your uh, completion letter. Uh, you only have 180 days approximately after, or, or six months approximately after you graduate to apply for a PGWP. So to prove that you completed your, your study program, you can submit your, your uh, degree or a diploma, transcript of records, or official letter, or you call it as completion letter from your DLI. So if your study permit, uh, let us say, will expire before you get your marks, you have two options. Lots of students are coming to me and asking me what can they do or what they supposed to do. Their study permit will expire before they get their marks. The two options are apply for a visitor record to stay in Canada longer or leave Canada and apply for your PGWB from outside. So uh, what to watch for? You must ensure that you meet the condition of your uh, study permit throughout your stay as a student. If a student violates the terms of your study permit, this could jeopardize your future immigration applications. That includes your permanent residency. No? So as an international student, you can only work for up to 20 hours per week. No? So make sure, make sure uh, of that. And you need to make sure also that you are a full-time student, no? not doing a uh, part-time. So you can check with your admission advisor uh, yeah, to make sure that you have that full-time um, student status. 
So in applying for uh, PGWP, make sure that you are using the correct form. Always refer to uh, the site www.canada.ca only. I know there are lots of bloggers or bloggers now who are sharing their experiences, providing guidance, but still check or reference the, the information from www.canada.ca only. You can treat your application like a thesis defense. It's not about uh, filling out forms and completing what is mentioned in the checklist. So I also highly suggest create a cover letter or uh, a statement of purpose, or you call that also as a letter of intent. State why or explain to the visa officer why he or she must approve your application. Uh, it is also important to make sure that your passport is valid for the entire length of time that you should be eligible for PGWP. So if your passport expires earlier, no, uh, your PGWP will be issued based on the validity of the passport. No? So if, for example, if, if uh, you supposed to be the, the uh, visa officer will give you like uh, three years of PGWP, but if your passport is only valid for another two years, so you're going to lose the one year uh, opportunity to work or, or to get an open work permit. So um, yeah, will be issued based on the validity of your passport and you will be advised if you need to extend it to the full validity. That will definitely create anxiety for you, right? And you wanna make sure that you're gonna get and ma or maximize the, the validity of the PGWP that you can be uh, eligible for. Uh, let's move to uh, page 11, talking about the visitors. So if you are in a visitor status in Canada, and um, luckily you, you worked your way out and receive a job offer uh, from a Canadian employer, this will be your ticket to applying for a work permit, that LMIA, no, mostly LMIA. Please note that majority of the job offer needs to be supported by an LMIA. LMIA means Labor Market Impact Assessment. However, Depending on your nationality, position, and type of job offer, you could be eligible for an LMI exempt work permit. You have to pay attention to the validity of your temporary residence visa or, or visitor visa. Uh, how do you know when your temporary resident status expires? I'm also receiving a lot of questions about this one. So if you're traveling with a passport, which is for sure majority of a few traveled with a passport. So when you arrive, arrived in Canada, the port of entry, no, and you gave your passport to the to the officer or CBSA, they placed a stamp in your passport. Uh, check your passport. If you find a stamp and the officer placed a handwritten date on it, your temporary resident status would would expire on that date. But if there is no stamp. You entered uh, Canada, the port of entry, no stamp, no handwritten date or, or any document given by, by the officer. Your TRV or your visitor visa will expire six months from the day you arrived in Canada. So that is automatic, six months. So you must carefully plan your transition as you're working on timelines here, you know, being on a visitor uh, status. So uh, if the employer who is offering you a job is yet to apply for LMIA, you know, LMIA processing time takes about nine to 63 business days as of today. In the LMI application, it is the employer that is being assessed. It is not you, uh, not the worker. So make sure that you are dealing with an eligible employer and it has no past compliance issue. Now, if there was a past refusal, uh, you know, on the employer side when they applied for uh, their past LMI application, so that, or we call it as a compliance issue, it's more of there's a possibility that they may get a negative de decision on the LMIA. And of course, you know, like what I've said, you're working on timelines here. So make sure that you're dealing with eligible employer without compliance issue in the past. So 
LMI also, it's very important. When you receive an offer letter, make sure that they're offering you a full-time, not seasonal jobs, not part-time jobs, not temporary jobs, and must last for at least uh, one year. So, okay, the employer applied for the LMIA. They received a positive decision. So that is the time that you can apply for a work permit. So you need a piece of paper. No, that is the LMIA. The employer has to provide you the copy of it to apply for a work permit. So that permit is employer specific, means you cannot work with uh, another employer or other employer. So uh, as of today, the work permit processing time from inside Canada is 141 days approximately. Now, with my experience, I did have uh, like, we processed for like two months. So it's less than, it was less than uh, 141 days. So it's just like approximate 141 days. You cannot work legally while your work permit application is on process, no? So again, if you're in a visitor status, you applied for a work permit supported with an LMIA, it doesn't mean you can start work with the, with the employer. No, you cannot. You need to wait for that decision of your, LMI, uh, of your work permit application. So um, yeah, to be eligible to apply, an applicant looking to benefit from this temporary uh, policy, you must have a valid status in Canada as a visitor uh, when you apply uh, at the time of the application. So have a job offer that is supported by uh, LMIA or an LMIA exempt uh, offer of employment. And uh, you have to submit an application no later than February 28, 2025. And of course, you also need to meet all other standard admissibility uh, criteria. So we are talking about uh, the medical and criminality admissibility and other uh, factors. So those applicants who currently have a visitor status, but have held a valid work permit in the past 12 months can get an interim work authorization to start working for the new employer before uh, the work permit application is finalized. Means, yeah, if, if you have a, a, a work permit in the past uh, 12 months, valid work permit, like let us say uh, you left your uh, your employer and then you, you, you found a new employer, you can apply for a work permit. As soon as you submit your application, you can immediately join the new company and start work. Yeah, we can move to uh, the PR options. Yeah, let us discuss your PR options and uh, you can apply now one uh, under the express entry. It is a point-based uh, system. Uh, next is the provincial nominee program. And uh, this program is for workers who have the skills education and work experience to contribute to the economy of that specific uh, province. No, um, yeah, uh, Atlantic Immigration Program or AIP. And the fourth one is the Rural and Northern Immigration Pilot, which is the RNIP. Now, and it's becoming very popular nowadays. Let's move to uh, the express entry. So it is a PR pathway for skilled workers in Canada, those people from inside Canada or uh, from overseas. For potential skilled workers, express entry will result in a faster processing time of six months or less. Now, uh, the express entry manages applications for PR under three immigration programs. So the Federal Skilled Worker Program, Federal Skilled Trades uh, Program and the Canadian Experience Class. Provinces and territories can also recruit uh, candidates from Express Entry through their PNPs to meet local labor uh, needs. So under the Express Entry, remember this, job offer is not mandatory, but can surely help boost your uh, score or CRS score. So how it works, uh, you have to create your profile to enter the pool. Now, once you submit your profile, you will get a score to determine your place in the pool 
using the CRS. You can update your profile as needed. For example, you took uh, another IELTS or CELPIP and, and got uh, a better score. You can update your profile. Uh, you receive a job offer, for example, you can update your profile. So again, the job offer that I am referring to, if it's under the express entry, it must be LMIA supported. You need an LMIA to, uh, I mean, to boost your score, to add score to, to your express entry profile. And uh, a job offer uh, can give you uh, 50 points to the uh, express entry. After that, you need to wait for the invitation to apply. You will be invited to apply first if you are nominated by a province. Second, if you are among the top ranked in the express entry pool based on your skills and experience. So if you, if you receive the invitation to apply or ITA, you will only have 90 days to submit an application for permanent residence. You may also qualify for uh, PNP or territorial nomination as part of the express entry. Um, yeah, uh, provinces and territories are able to nominate uh, candidates who meet uh, their labor needs. Some provinces and territories search in the pool uh, for candidates from the express entry, while others require you to apply directly to their uh, province uh, website. So if you are nominated through a PNP program, you will be invited to apply for permanent residency. Yeah, and um, let's talk about eligibility. We can move to the next slide. So what is being assessed in the express entry? So you can see there the skills, education, language ability, work experience, and other factors. Yeah, age is a factor in uh, immigration, in the Canadian immigration. If you have the Canadian education and if you have your past education from overseas, that can also top up your score. If you're a French speaker, you know, as well as you can, you can converse or uh, in English, like two languages, you can take IELTS. No, and you can also take uh, like a TEF or TCF Canada for showing your French uh, proficiency. If you have a Canadian work experience, so that is what I was uh, talking about. If you gain a Canadian work experience, that will also top your, uh, I mean, uh, can add score to your express entry profile. Uh, if you have a certificate of qualification, so this applies to regulated professions in Canada. For example, if you're an engineer, no, and you receive, um, I mean, a professional engineer designation from, for example, uh, APEGA. So I'm talking about uh, Alberta. That's Association for uh, Engineers here in Alberta who can uh, provide you or guide you through uh, getting a certificate of qualification. So that will also add to your ex express uh, entry uh, points. So yeah, if you receive a job offer supported with LMIA, it must have, I mean, LMIA that can add 50 points to your score. And if you receive a PNP nomination, this is actually like a home run. I always say, if you receive a PNP uh, nomination or provincial nomin uh, program nomination, you will receive a 600 points. So it's like a home run if you receive a PNP nomination. And if you have siblings in Canada, no? so I'm not talking about like a mother or parents or cousins or friends. It must be siblings with the same parents, mother and father. No, uh, yeah, you can also, I mean, they can also help in topping up, uh, you know, points to your, to your uh, express entry uh, profile. So um, just under, under the Canadian experience class, um, not everyone knows, I believe about this, there is no education requirement. No? Uh, you can apply even uh, you don't have your bachelor's degree or, or, or a diploma. It is not a requirement, the education, but you having a good education backed up with education credential assessment or ECA uh, that can boost your uh, CRS 
score. So when, when your profile gets picked up and you have been invited to apply or you receive an ITA to apply for a permanent residency, uh, part of the assessment is the admissibility check. Now, uh, first is the uh, criminal admissibility. That's why you have to submit your police clearance from all countries from the age, uh, I mean, 18, 18 years old. You have to submit your police clearance certificates uh, from those countries where you stayed for more than six months. Now, like in my case, I do remember when, when we were, or when I was applying for permanent resident, residency, I had to, I had to submit uh, like a seven, I have to sub submit seven police clearances from all those countries that I have, you know, uh, I've been, I've been uh, since the age of 18. Uh, medical inadmissibility, that's why you have to go for a medical, you know, uh, through panel physicians or authorized uh, physicians or clinic. So this includes a medical condition, checking your medical condition. Do you have any condition that could endanger uh, public health, uh, could endanger public safety, or can cause excessive demand in uh, Canada? Now, uh, another one also uh, that is causing inadmissibility concern is misrepresentation. So if the immigration found out that you have submitted fraudulent or fake documents, that is a ground for misrepresentation and that can lead to a ban of five years. You cannot enter Canada, even applying for a visitor or a study permit, another uh, immigration application, you cannot. No, it's a five-year uh, ban. Um, if you also have, they will also check the inadmissibility, uh, I mean, um, status of a family member. Family member, we are talking about your spouse, your common law partner, your dependent children, adopted children, or a child of your spouse if, if they have from their previous partners. Now, all of you must pass uh, the inadmissibility because if one uh, fail, then it will cause a refusal. You cannot, even if you say that, okay, they won't be joining us in, in Canada. It's only you and your spouse to immigrate to Canada. Your children won't immigrate. No, they will be in, in your home country. Still, if they don't pass the inadmissibility concern, automatically your application will be refused. So there is also a LICA requirements. Uh, we are talking about the financial side. So in your application for PR, you need to satisfy the visa officer that you have sufficient funds to show at the time of the application. Uh, yeah, in layman terms, it is called LICO, um, low income cutoff. You must have uh, the intention, this is the last one, you must have the intention of living outside the province of, of Quebec. Yeah. We can move to the next one. Let's talk about the provincial nominee program. So this PNP offers uh, pathways. It's a permanent residency uh, pathway to people who are interested to immigrating to a specific province or territory. So each province and territory except Quebec and none of it, which offer, operate uh, its own programs. It is designed for uh, to meet the province or territory's specific uh, economic needs. Altogether, currently there are more than 80 different PNP streams. I know it could be overwhelming, but there are more than 80 provincial nominee program streams. And uh, the PNP uh, may target students, business people, skilled workers, um, semi-skilled workers, and uh, many uh, provincial nominee program um, gives preferences to applicants who have some kind of connection to the province. And that includes, uh, for example, if you studied in, uh, in that province or completed education in that, in that province, if you have your family members, relatives, friends, uh, and work experience from that province, that can definitely help in your PR, um, PNP application. So depending on the province where an international student completed uh, the program, then you may be eligible for a stream specific to uh, province international uh, students. 
So I know it's overwhelming. There are lots of choices. Imagine more than 80, uh, just talking about the, uh, the provincial nominee program. But if you ask me what I will consider, you know, the guidance that I'm providing to my client, what should they consider picking up the province and why each would make the perfect place to, to call home? So personally speaking, I would choose the job market. Is it easy for me to, to find job in that province? I will also consider the weather, but that is secondary. Oh, and um, the connection. Um, I'm talking about do I have relatives or, or friends uh, in that province that can help me, you know, somehow settle in that uh, province and the easiness of the uh, immigration rules. But I will give you one tip. Applying for a PNP, choose a province where your work experience falling under the in-demand occupation because it's more of you will receive an invitation to apply. You know, um, because you may get a better chance of, of being nominated, like what I've said, um, because province chooses candidates with skills or work experience that can help the province respond to their labor caps. So having a close relatives, you know, can help, help you also immigrate uh, to that uh, province. So when I say in demand occupation, it's a public uh, information. If you can get the time to check each and every province website related to their PNP, you may find the list of the in-demand occupation. So if your occupation is, is listed under that category, put your application forward. Let's go to the next. So what are the provinces and territories uh, that offer provincial nomination? So this uh, you see on your screen are provinces and territories that offer provincial nomination. If you can see, you don't see um, Quebec and Yukon territory. Oh, sorry, it, it's there, sorry. Yeah, so you, you don't see it there. So for example, for Quebec, they run their own immigration uh, program, but it doesn't fall under the uh, provincial nominee program. Yeah, we can move to the next. So let us understand the uh, application process under the, the PNP. Now there are two types of application under the provincial nominee program. First is the non-express entry process and you must apply in two stages. First, you must decide where you wanna live in Canada and then apply to that province for a nomination. So your chosen province will review your application based on uh, the province immigration needs. If I say province immigration needs, the keyword there is, is your work experience falling under the in-demand occupation of that province? And if you really plan to live there. No? After a province or territory nominates you, you must apply to uh, IRCC for permanent uh, residence. End of it, it's still the IRCC or the Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada who is deciding or approving or refusing the application. The second process is the express entry uh, process. You must be eligible for one of the province or territories provincial nominee program and you must receive a nomination. So before you apply through the express entry, you must first check your eligibility requirements. No? So uh, check uh, the pros and cons, living in that particular province, um, and then uh, the express entry that program you wanna qualify for or you wanna apply for, and check also if you're eligible for the province or territories PNP program. Yeah, let's try Alberta. So Alberta, I am sitting in Alberta. I am from Edmonton, uh, Alberta. So uh, my province or Alberta is known for its large oil and natural gas. And that is the province largest industry being the oil and gas uh, sector. We also offer, or Alberta also offers lower taxes than the rest of Canada. We are sitting at 5%. I'm talking about the, the, the tax compared to other provinces where in tax can be up to 
15%. So this province has a total of seven immigration streams. Lots of people, you know, international students, foreign workers, they are moving to Alberta. So they're saying, is it easy to, to get a job there in Alberta? Actually, what I could say is there is no, it's not an easy task looking for work, you know, especially if, you're, if your hopes are uh, to apply or, or a job offer that can support your permanent residency. Uh, yeah, it has a total of seven immigration streams categorized under stream for workers and stream for entrepreneurs. So you need a job offer for some of the streams while others don't. No? So the province has a design stream for international students. No? You can apply under the graduate entrepreneur stream. And there's also the international graduates who completed their studies at an approved Alberta post-secondary uh, institutions are eligible to apply for Alberta uh, provincial nomination under the Alberta Opportunity Stream or AOS. So according to statistics, Alberta welcomes over 40,000 new immigrants in an average year. It is definitely worth your time exploring the Alberta PNB. I can tell you that. Let's move to British Columbia. So uh, BC is uh, the second destination of choice by immigrants next to Ontario. Still, Ontario is number one. I will talk about Ontario later on. About BC, they are known to offering good climate with the mildest winter in all of Canada. So many industries in BC include agriculture, uh, construction, film and television, forestry, technology, manufacturing, mining, uh, tourism, and uh, British Columbia offers the second highest minimum wage next to Yukon territory. So they're sitting on uh, $16.75 uh, an hour for, for BC. And there are three um, categories under the BC Provincial Nominee Program. So they are categorized under skills immigration, express entry, and entrepreneur immigration. So they mainly target skilled workers, uh, healthcare professionals, and people in technology uh, sector. And uh, there is an international graduate category in the PNP under the skills immigration category that you can also take uh, advantage of. Let's move to Manitoba. So uh, this province is mainly dominated by food uh, machinery. Mining is also a key sector for uh, employment. Manitoba is one of the provinces that greatly values connection to the province, whether it's through a support of a family or a family member or even friends. So uh, yeah, you can see there under skilled worker stream, Workers from Manitoba and uh, workers from overseas can apply under the business investors stream. So it, it is open to applicants seeking to start or purchase a business in Manitoba and for those intending to uh, establish or operate a farm operation in rural uh, Manitoba. So they also, uh, they also have an international education stream uh, dedicated to providing uh, graduates from the province faster pathways to nomination. So uh, please note, if you are an international student who graduated in another province of Canada, let us say graduated from BC or from Alberta or from Ontario, you will not be eligible under this stream. No, the international education stream, you cannot apply uh, to that, but you may be eligible under the skilled worker in Manitoba stream. It means to say, you must have a job offer now uh, to apply for a skilled worker in Manitoba stream. So who cannot apply uh, to the uh, Manitoba PNP? Refugee claimants or individuals involved in a federal appeal or a removal process. If you're a living caregivers currently living in Canada, if you're a TFW or temporary foreign workers, currently working and residing in a province other than Manitoba. No? So if you're a TFW, you're working or living in uh, Ontario, for example, you cannot apply for a PNP uh, in Manitoba. And if you have been refused 
by the Manitoba PNP within the last six months and, and you were not able to address the reasons for the refusal, you cannot apply as well. No? And those applications, if you have an active application with any other provincial nominee program or federal immigration program in Canada, you cannot also apply under the MP and PR Manitoba PNP. They want an exclusive application uh, for the uh, province of Manitoba. Let's go to New Brunswick. So uh, New Brunswick offers five uh, immigration streams. So you can you can actually see there are three, but they have five. First one is the express entry stream. To qualify, you must create your uh, federal express entry, be placed in the pool, and meet the requirements of the New Brunswick express entry stream. Please note that you cannot have an application to the uh, New Brunswick express entry stream without a valid federal express entry profile. And there is a, for skilled worker stream, the job offer is mandatory for this program. And they have the business immigration stream. It is designed for experienced entrepreneurs uh, who are ready to establish, operate, and actively uh, manage a business while living in, and settling in the province permanently. They have also, it is not mentioned, it is not, you cannot see that on the slide, but there is a critical worker pilot. It is a five year pilot program, means, uh, pilot means testing. No, they're testing the program, and that can assess or address critical labor shortages in, uh, across the region in the province. It is an employer driven stream, means to say you must have a job offer to apply for uh, this strip. And the employer also must be a participant uh, employer or designated. And uh, the other one also is the private uh, career college graduate pilot. So it is accessible to new graduates from uh, specific private colleges in New Brunswick. Uh, if they're not eligible for the federal PGWP, no, yeah, uh, probably, you know, you can only apply for a PGWP if you uh, graduated from a public, uh, from public colleges, you call this designated learning institution. So if, you're, um, if your school is from a, a private career colleges, unfortunately, you cannot apply for a PGWP. So this pilot program is for you and you can apply for that. But you need a job offer to qualify for this stream and you have 90 days upon uh, graduating to secure a full-time employment in an identified priority occupation, and it must be related to your field of study. So let's move to New Finland. Yeah, you can see the, um, I mean, immigration streams available in the province. So do you need a job offer to be eligible for the province PNP? Yes, you must have a full-time job offer from a New Finland. Uh, employer. Full-time means you will be working a minimum of 30 hours per week. Is it LMIA supported job offer? The answer is no. You don't need an LMIA for this. So they also have um, international graduate stream. Uh, recent graduates, you need to have a job offer from a new Finland employer falling under NOC 0A, B, and C jobs, and it must be falling under the in-demand occupation uh, category to qualify. And you must be 21 to 59 years old also to apply for that. So let's move to Nova Scotia. So like the rest of uh, the provinces, Nova Scotia selects and nominates people that will contribute, of course, to their uh, labor gaps. So the processing time for eligible application can be three months or more. So within six months of receiving your nomination certificate, apply to IRCC for your permanent residency visa. Yeah, and for Ontario, so it is by far the most popular uh, province. We can move to Ontario. Yeah, the most, um, page 24, yeah. Ontario is by far the most popular province among immigrants who are coming to Canada. No, because Ontario offers a strong economy and is home to nearly 50% of employees in high tech, you know, those uh, financial uh, services and knowledge intensive uh, industries. 
So there are different uh, nine streams to be specific that you may qualify for. You must register an um, expression of interest to receive an invitation to apply. So if you have a job offer in Ontario, I know many of you could be from Ontario. If you have a job offer from an eligible uh, employer, you can apply under the foreign worker stream, international student stream, and in-demand skills stream. So if you have a master's or completed your master's and a PhD from an Ontario university, you can apply under the master's graduate stream and PhD graduate stream, and you do not need a, a job offer to qualify. So if you have the skills and experience that Ontario employers need, so we're talking about the in-demand occupation, now you can apply under the human capital priority stream and skill trades uh, stream. And uh, yeah, if you're a French speaker, you can, you can apply under the French speaking skilled worker stream. So these streams operate through the federal government's express entry system. And to qualify, you must have an express entry profile and receive an invitation of interest from Ontario. You, you do not need, um, yeah, so again, um, if you have the skills and experience, the last three, human capital, skilled trade stream, French speaking skilled worker stream, you do not need a job offer to qualify. So if you are a foreign entrepreneur with a great business idea, not just any business, no, it, it must be a business, a, I mean, a great business idea, you can apply under the entrepreneur stream. Now you can establish a new business or you can buy and grow an existing business in uh, Ontario. And let's move to uh, Prince Edward Island. So the province uh, offers eight streams under the uh, PNP. So all streams requires a job offer from eligible uh, province employers and have at least two years of uh, full-time work experience in the last five years. So it's only the express uh, entry for the PEI stream that do not uh, impose a job offer. So, um, however, the province prioritizes applicants with a job offer from an eligible employer. Uh, it's still an advantage if you have a job offer. And the age to apply uh, can be between 18 years old to 59 years old. You'll be eligible to apply. And let's move to Saskatchewan. Uh, the hubs of uh, cultural or agricultural production in Canada, you need a job offer applying under the international skilled worker category and worker with Saskatchewan work experience. If you don't have job offer, you can apply under the international skilled workers under the occupation in demand. So if, if you're thinking of uh, applying through the entrepreneur, uh, I mean, application, an investment of 200,000 to 300,000 Canadian dollars is, is required. Yeah, so let's move to provincial or uh, northern territories. So there is a less, it, this, um, I mean, territory is uh, less populated with just over 45,000 based on the e statistics in uh, 2022. So you need a job offer to apply for uh, their uh, stream. So uh, if, and the business stream is for foreign nationals who want to start business in in the territory, an investment of 100,000 to 200,000 is required. Oh, and they also offer a fast, a faster processing time. Now the province uh, portal says that, that you can expect no wait list for your application. And let's move to, to Yukon. So it's, uh, it has over 40,000 uh, population. Now, and to apply PR for this category, you need to have a full-time year-round job offer from an eligible Yukon employer. And for the uh, the Quebec, you know, they run uh, their own program. Like what I've said, it is not falling under the provincial nominee program as they run their own immigration system. And um, however similar, we can move to Quebec, Sam. So, like the rest of the of Canada, Quebec immigration programs are designed in such a way that you know it is expected to have some positive contribution to the economy of, of Quebec. 
So all of their programs require a job offer from an eligible uh, employer from, from Quebec. Let's move to Atlantic Immigration Program. Yeah, it is uh, kind of popular. So Atlantic Immigration Program is a pathway for PR for skilled foreign workers and international graduates. So if we say Atlantic provinces, so we are talking about New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, or Newfoundland and Labrador. It is an employer-driven program, means you need to have an offer letter from designated employer. Now, so you have to verify if the job offer that you are receiving is from a designated employer. So uh, what this uh, pathway offers, there is no age limit, low IELTS requirements, so depending on your tier or NOC, now, uh, your, the score requirement could be uh, like a CLB4 or a CLB5. They also offer low processing time of six months. No LMI, it's not required for the job offer. And no express entry or CRS score required. And you can obtain a work permit before permanent residence. And uh, next one, the Rural Northern Immigration Pilot. I have lots of applicants uh, for this uh, program. So these are communities that are designated. No, the communities must be designated to be part of this RNIP. Uh, because Canada is a country known for accepting high numbers of immigrants. However, they want to go to, uh, I mean, major cities like Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver. So RNIP seeks to change this by helping small communities to attract newcomers and support the settlement. So they're accepting invitations or applications from rural and Northern communities who would like to participate. So this program or pathway runs or running since 2019. No, and it's still uh, up and running. So offer from a designated employer in the community is mandatory, but this job offer is not supported with LMIA, you don't need an uh, LMIA if it's through the uh, RNIB. Yeah, feel free to contact me if you have more questions about this. Yeah, let's go to when to call an immigration uh, consultant. Again, it is not mandatory for you to hire a consultant or a lawyer to represent you in your Canadian immigration application. However, if you go to uh, do it yourself, uh, strategy or DIY strategy. That means you need to be expert, uh, you know, uh, moving through the complex system of programs, deadlines, forms, and more. So if, if you feel like DIY or do-it-yourself sounds like too much for you, there are common situations where people hire a Canadian immigration consultant. Yeah, let's move to, to the next. Uh, that is, for example, if you have been uh, refused in the past, no, I mean, I, I could say no matter what the reason was, you surely not want to make the same uh, mistake again or completely new, uh, I mean, make a mistake um, yeah, altogether. So this is where a consultant or a lawyer can help you enormously. So number two, if you're applying to a more complex uh, immigration programs, like what I've said, there are more than 80 PNP streams. Now, uh, plus the express entry, it is really over overwhelming. So if I am representing you, for example, in your application, it will be my obligation to make sure that all forms and documents are in place. And I also have to provide you with regular updates about your application. And if you have potential medical inadmissibility concern, now uh, you could be inadmissible if you're causing excessive demand or excess, um, on existing social or health services provided by the government of Canada, or if you have the condition that would endanger the health or safety of the Canadian population due to contagious disease. Now, there are ways to, to, to overcome somehow. Um, I, I'm not saying that 100% you can overcome that, but uh, yeah, a good advice from an immigration consultant or a lawyer can definitely help. Uh, number four, if you have the criminal criminal inadmissibility concern, no, you don't need to have to uh, rob a bank or committed a murder to be deemed criminally inadmissible in Canada. 
some minor crimes can put you in on the IRCC's blacklist. For example, if you have the conviction for dangerous driving or pet, petty uh, theft, that could be a problem. But there are ways to overcome a criminal admission and be approved for entry to Canada. But of course, it requires ex expert knowledge. A licensed immigration consultant or lawyer may have that knowledge and experience defending similar cases. We can definitely help. So if you have the number five change in the family status, uh, yeah, I, I have uh, several um, applicants for this. If you have previously undeclared family members on your last immigration application, you change your marital status in similar uh, situation, it is highly suggested to get a consultant or a lawyer to handle your case. Remember, it is your family's future that is at stake here. And most importantly, number six, if you have a limited uh, knowledge of the Canadian immigration laws and regulation, like what I've said, immigration is a legal application. It is a legal application. So it's not a matter of completing the forms and submit documents that are on the checklist. You have to do it right the first time as much as possible. Receiving application refusal can give you more damage and could be, I mean, expensive in the long term. Uh, next, what will you do after you apply? You put your application forward for uh, PR. You have to get your documents ready you, because you only have limited days to submit your full application package after you receive an invitation to apply. Now make sure you have your, your IELTS or, or, or the French uh, proficiency uh, report. It has a valid, validity of two years. You have your ECA, make sure it is valid. It is valid for five years. And you have the police clearances. Now, if you don't have your police clearance, for example, you cannot provide. It's either you decline your invitation to apply. Of course, that's the last thing that you want to do or prove to IRCC that you tried applying for the police clearances, but you are not able to, to, to get it. And try to improve your uh, score. Get a valid job offer. You know, it must be supported with LMIA uh, if it's through the express entry. Contact provinces and territories to consider you for the provincial nominee program, or you can try taking another language test, uh, especially if you are confident that you can excel better than your previous uh, tries. Now, make sure to keep your profile up to date. Your profile is only valid for one year. No, um, yeah, that's all I can say. Uh, after you put your application forward, make sure you have all your documents ready. Yeah, so thank you so much for your time. And I am really hoping that this session helps you plan your future to becoming a permanent resident of Canada. Yes, John. Thank you very much, Geraldine. That was really, really informative and, and um, a terrific presentation. Thanks again. Uh, a lot of information to unpack there. Um, I know we went a little over time, but would you have some time to answer just a few of the questions? Yes, I can help. Yeah. Okay. How about, um, so Hanel asked, uh, how many years of operation can a business uh, can a business issue LMIA? So how how many years does a business need to be in operation in order to issue an LMIA? They must be one year old. One year old, terrific. Yeah, Thank that's you. the minimum because of like applying for LMIA, the uh, the employer needs to submit the CRA documents, so they must be able to, you know, uh, file their taxes. Terrific. That's why one year. Thank you. Um, same person asked, um, so we had six months experience in Ontario when we were laid off during the recession, uh, I guess during, during the pandemic. Um, if they move to Alberta, will their Ontario experience count? Yes, there are pathways where in, uh, if you have uh, work experience from outside Alberta, definitely there are pathways available for, for them. Terrific, thank you. Um, Manzi asks, how many points are needed to come through express entry? You need to have a minimum of 300 points to enter the express uh, entry pool, a minimum of 300. Uh, Follow-up question that one she asked as well is, um, also, is there an easy province to apply to? Uh, you know, I always say uh, check 
your work experience, is it falling under the in-demand occupation category of the province? So if you see that your work experience is falling in the in those province, you can apply, you can put multiple applications to uh, different provinces. If you're, um, yeah, falling under the um, in-demand occupation, apply to those province. Um, I believe there's no shortcuts no, in applying for uh, like Canadian immigration. It really needs a lot of uh, like a patience and uh, yeah, check all all the provinces. But yeah, if it's falling under the in-demand occupation, apply to that province. That's the easiest I could say, easier. Yeah, good, thanks. Um, KJ asks, uh, for work permit holders, after completing how many years can they apply for their PR? Um, again, uh, after one year, they can apply under the uh, Canadian Experience class of the Express Entry. No, uh, but Express Entry, it is a point-based uh, system. But uh, my observation is under the Express Entry for Canadian Experience class, the points uh, for those who are getting invited, the, um, the points is not that high, so they can give it a try. Canadian experience class of the express entry, and then you can also check the pathway available for them through the um, uh, provincial nominee. They can also check the RNIP, and if they receive a job offer from uh, Atlantic provinces, then it, they can apply under the uh, AIB, Atlantic Immigration Program. Terrific. But a couple questions about um, specific career choices. So one was asking about: um, uh, Is it is it are they able to enter Canada um, and get a, and get a, um, a PR with an IT education? And someone else is asking: um, With a law degree, they're finding it difficult to get into Canada, um, and can they apply for different roles? Are there are there different um, industries or, or 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 courses of of education that people should be um, addressing or going towards? Mm -hmm. uh, so again. Um... First, uh, what I will check in my uh, personal practice, no, uh, first, what I do is check if they will qualify under the express entry. Now, if not, then I go to uh, provinces and check if there are opportunities uh, from those province or provinces. Yeah, but definitely they have, if your education is, is good, no, I uh, use it if they have the master's degree, especially or PhD, no, and they have a good IELTS score. Definitely, there are, uh, I mean, uh, chances to apply for permanent residency. But again, um, because I'm, I'm getting lots of clients, but when I ask them if they have the IELTS or the English proficiency uh, report, no, and if they have the ECA, if they don't have that, they cannot, you know, I, I mean, I cannot guess if they can apply under the, the express entry and, and other PNP. Terrific, thank you. Um, so we have time for just one more. Um, this is from Caesar. Um, does the spouse of the main applicant have to speak the language, try to try, uh, complete the language test as well? Um, and what is your advice for uh, for whom had completed only high school education, um, whoever possesses work experience in IT, marketing, multimedia management, and many jobs in the last twenty years? So, um, I guess two questions there. One is, does the does the spouse have to also complete the language test? Um, and second, um, is it practical experience or educational experience taken into account? Okay, uh, so does the spouse of the main applicant have to do the language test as well? If it is under the express entry, uh, uh, I mean program or, or system, no, that can add a uh, score. If the spouse, uh, you know, submit uh, IELTS or the, the English or French proficiency report, that can top up uh, the score. Or if they have also, let us say if the spouse is a bachelor's degree, uh, yeah, and with the education credential assessment report, that can also add points to, to the application. And uh, the question is what advice? Uh, yeah, I guess it's kind of the question, meaning like would, would they, they take educational experience over practical working experience? that actually uh, goes hand uh, in hand. 
However, um, like for example, if Cesar comes here, um, okay, he he got an experience in IT with a Canadian employer, but his education is only high school education. Now that he can uh, probably submit his application under the Canadian experience class of the express entry. Like what I've said, there is no education requirement under the uh, Canadian experience class of the express entry. Uh, unfortunately, uh, most or, or the rest of other uh, programs that require some minimum of uh, high school education uh, equivalent to Canadian high school. So for him, yeah, if it's high school education, he needs to prove through the ECA, Education Credential Assessment, if it is comparable to Canadian high school. Even if it's no, yeah, he can come work for a Canadian employer, get a Canadian work experience, can apply under the Canadian experience class of the Express Entry. Um, terrific. I think that's all we have time for right now, um, guys. I know there's a couple more questions we didn't get to. I'm sorry, but um, there are some links on the screen you can see, um, links to um, to both to ADECO and to, and to uh, GHV. Um, I'm happy to um, to address those questions if you forward them on to us, or we'll try to get these responded to um, through the chat as well if we can. Um, thank you very much to everyone who joined us today, and thank you very much, Geraldine, for your time um, and your expertise today. It was really educational and uh, very, very helpful, and I hope everyone on the line found it helpful as well. Um, and I wish you all a great day, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.